All right. Welcome to Raising Wool, Raising Sheep for Wool. Today we are we're here with uh, Regina Fromm and Emily Chamberlain Hicklin. Hickman, <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, shearing day. Today is a big day here on the farm. Um, in the, shearers are known for their speed, but also uh, shearers are really important because they the way they handle your animals and the way they handle your the fleece uh, is really impacts quality and the health and um, livelihood of the animals and the farm. So we're going to talk with them today about how that goes here on. Um, Regina's farm and so behind the scenes. Uh, so my name, I'm Greg Padgett. I'm the next generation director for Practical Farmers of Iowa. And accompanying behind the scenes is Megan Filbert, our livestock manager. She's going to be helping make sure that all the virtual world things go well. Um, but today we want to thank our major sponsors before we get started because they're really um, what helps support and make these field days free. We really appreciate the um, generosity that they provide to make that happen. And today we are partner, excited to partner with the Iowa Sheep Association, um, who continue to educate Iowa, about Iowa's sheep production. Uh, Practical Farmers is a nonprofit organization that's based out of Ames. We uh, specialize in farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge sharing and uh, research, farmer-led research. Um, our mission is to equip farmers to build resilient farms and communities, and all are welcomed at PFI. We, are, we invite you to check out more about our organization at our website at practicalfarmers.org. Our field day today will last about three, till about three o'clock, so we got about an hour here. And so if you have questions for Regina or Emily, just put those in the um, comments section and then Megan will ensure that those are passed on to us here um, in the barn. And then at the conclusion of the event, we just ask that you provide your feedback. We'll share an evaluation link for you to do so. So I'm going to have Emily do a quick little introduction, and then we'll pass it over to Regina. Emily, we can't. Emily, okay. we can't hear you very well. You might be muted, Emily. I'm muted. There we go. Perfect. Am I better? Yes. <laughs> so, like you said, my name is Emily Chamberlain Hickman, and I'm actually from Maryland, but uh, I've had the privilege of shearing out here in Iowa for several years. Um, I worked for a guy named Alex Moser up in uh, northwestern uh, Iowa and, and worked on his crew for a while. So I've been kind of all around. I've sheared in the Iowa State Fair shearing competition for several years. You guys have a really great competition here. Um, so and I've also traveled overseas. I've traveled to several states. Uh, and so as, as a professional sheep shearer, I've really kind of gotten around. Um, but I've been shearing now. It's been close to 15 years. Uh, out in Maryland, there is sort of a specialty market of doing more hand spinner type fleeces. So that tends to be my, my preference uh, and my, my personal uh, passion is shearing fleeces for hand spinners. Um, but actually my trips out here to Iowa were more for just gaining more experience and, and trying to gain speed and get numbers sort of under my belt. Because uh, when it does come down to shearing, it is all about repetition. It's about muscle memory. And really good shears don't have to think too much about what they're doing because the, the hand just kind of goes to where it, uh, it needs to go to get the wool off that sheep. But I also uh, serve as the secretary treasurer of the American Sheep Shears Council. Um, so we do have a, an organization that uh, we try to address shearer issues, um, try to promote shearing schools. Uh, and trying to connect shears with each other so that you know learner or beginner shears who want to gain more experience can find uh, local resources or even resources that would be willing to help them out. Um, it is a small community, so we kind of all know somebody from every state, and uh, we're usually able to help people out. So any of you guys out there that are looking for shears, you know, it doesn't have to be the shear right in your area. It doesn't hurt to reach out to shears pretty much anywhere. Um, to try to track down information. Never be ashamed to just call a shearer out of the blue and say, hey, trying to find somebody. Do you know who works in this area? Or do you know somebody that travels through this area? So uh, like I said, small community, we all kind of talk and we all kind of keep in touch. So that's uh, one piece of advice I can give you is never, never be ashamed to just call a shearer and say, hey, I need some information. Do you know somebody? How can I do a better job with, with my shearing? Um, but yeah, so. Do we? Do you want me to go into anything more specific, or do you want Regina to do her intro? No, I think that's okay. Perfect. Let's see, Regina, can we hear you okay? 
Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Now we can't. So we were picking up that from Emily's phone. So you must have been. Oh. I will stand very close to Perfect. Regina. <laughs> Did it there you go. Okay. <laughs> Technology is great, especially in a building with a tin roof. Um, I'm Regina Fromm. Uh, this is our farm. Um, I, those of you that don't know me, the farm's been in my husband's family now since the mid 1800s. And it has always had livestock on it and it's always had sheep on it. So for us to bring the sheep back several years ago, it was just basically family tradition. So our main focus is on fine wool sheep. We do have a flock of uh, commercial, more meat geared sheep. Um, but predominantly we focus on the Cormo, um, which is a fine wool breed. <clears throat> um, we uh, raise the wool to be turned into either yarn or to be sold as raw fleece to hand spinners. So this year is gonna be a little different for us. Um, we'll go through talking about kind of what we do with the wool and why we do it that way. And then um, this, is, this year is a prime example of why we do what we do um, because we didn't do all those things. So as Emily said, she's been shearing for us for several years now. Um, she comes all the way out here from Maryland. And one of the big reasons that um, I like the way Emily shears is because she understands not only the uh, commercial flocks, but she understands fiber flocks. And she understands the time and care that go into raising the wool and um, being able to shear properly so that those fleeces maintain their value. Uh, losing my train of thought. So- What did you do to prepare for shearing day? So uh, typically what we do is we start watching the weather about a week before Emily comes. And I guess, um, first of all, a lot of people ask us why we shear in December when it's 16 degrees. So for <laughs> us, there's multiple reasons. One is because this is when Emily's free and she can come out here. And we are fortunate enough to have lots of buildings and lots of bedding so we can keep the sheep protected. We increase their feed um, so that they're producing more energy and more heat so that they um, don't lose weight and they're not really stressed anymore. Um, one thing that I've really learned to appreciate over the years in shearing this time of the year is I get to watch um, the condition, their body condition through their entire pregnancies. So our ewes are exposed to rams um, in October. So they're at the very beginning of their pregnancies right now. We lay them in March. This way, since they don't have, you know, 10 pounds of fleece on them, we make sure that they're not getting too skinny. They're not getting too fat. Um, we don't waste food by feeding them too much. And um, they stay healthier and make sure that they do get enough. So um, again, like I said, we start watching the weather about a week before she gets here. So this year, last Friday, of course, it decides to rain, snow. So all of the sheep got locked inside. Um, they were let out only when the weather wasn't raining or snowing. So they went out to graze. You know, they had water inside. They were fed inside if need be. But this way, it keeps the fleece dry. So when you have five inches of fleece on a sheep, all that moisture gets sucked down into it um, and it, it stays wet. It doesn't dry out overnight. So if the fleece is wet, it makes it very, very difficult um, for a shearer to be able to get their blades through the fleece. If they can't get the blades through the fleece, it's tearing the fleece, it's pulling the animal, and it's just, the whole experience is just a lot more difficult. Um, the next thing that um, we did is obviously they stayed pretty much inside the majority of that time from um, last Friday up until last night when we started the shearing process and again this morning. So uh, the other thing we do is we are very careful about how we feed and water them. So we start backing them off of all of their food starting, well, obviously they were, they were fed a little bit differently being inside, but for that 24 hour period up to shearing, um, they don't really get a lot to eat. They had access to water. Um, but the reason we do that is not to stress them, not to um, be inhumane, but it empties out their stomachs. And if their stomachs are empty, they're a lot easier to maneuver. To man they're, when you shear a sheep, it's flipped on its, its back end. And so all that weight from their stomach is in front of them and it's very uncomfortable. It makes it hard for them to breathe. 
um, it makes it hard for them to be turned and manipulated to be able to get the police off. So it makes Emily's job a lot easier. It's a lot more comfortable for the sheep and the day just goes a whole lot better. Can I add? Yes. That the sheep will continue to defecate within that 24 hour period. It does take about 24 hours to quote unquote, completely empty them out. So the stuff that they ate 24 hours beforehand has finally worked its way to the colon and then they're defecating that last little bit out. So if you are shearing sheep that have food within a shorter period of time, like we, we really recommend 12 hours, at least 12 hours, no food. Um, for a lot of sheep, that still isn't enough time. If you have excessive amounts of, of manure in your catch pen, if you have most of your sheep pooping on the board while you're shearing, you haven't fasted them enough. And they will poop on the board because that extra pressure, they just sort of release their bowels. That poop gets mixed into the wool as you're trying to you know, move the animal around and get the wool off. If, if you care about the wool and, and keeping it clean, um, you know, if you're marketing to hand spinners, that fasting is really, really important for that extra level of cleanliness and that extra time frame. You know, 12 to 20 hours is, is 20 is, is way closer to ideal than 12, but 12 is kind of the minimum, especially depending on what point in gestation they are. But if you do have a lot of excessive mess in your holding area or on your board, you really should push it back a little. And, and you will get animals that'll just continue to pee and poop throughout the day and then the by the end of the day your catch pen is a slurry and it's just liquid everywhere and it's starting to get on the sheep you just know that the next year you should push it back maybe a few more hours to try to empty them out and, and make sure your product stays pristine and your shear is also stepping in that and sliding around in it um <laughs> they do we, we've yes. had it happen before and it's it's not fun for them and yeah so anyway um, those are the biggest things we do to prep. The other thing we do is we make sure that we have a, a clean area inside the barn um, that we put plywood down on the floor. That way Emily has enough space to be able to hang um, her shearing equipment to have enough light. Um, we prepare an area so that we have a table spread out that we can put the fleeces on to be able to go through and, and skirt them, which we'll explain a little bit more. Um, you know, you just basically, you, you need to, even though it's in a barn and you're dealing with livestock, you want to make it, you know, it's not too hot, but not too cold. Today's a little bit of an exception on the cold, um, but an area to catch the sheep so that the sheep aren't running all over so that they're kind of condensed into an area so that they feel a little more secure. Um, have extra hands so that you have somebody that can um, either help move sheep in and out of that pen um, if we need extra hands holding onto the sheep. When we're done shearing, we go through some other steps. We might trim hooves. We might um, if, do um, any type of poron type application for parasite control. And then typically they get um, coats put back on to help keep the wool clean. So it's just a matter of being organized and ready to go and having some water and a little boot on hand. And that's kind of how we get through the day. Yeah. Hey, I would say like, 75 to 80% of your worst kind of fiber contamination can happen at the point of shearing. If you don't get the bedding away from your catch pen and away from your plywood, and when she says a piece of plywood, that's an entire piece of plywood. Every once in a while you get somebody that has like a little cut down section, but a sheep when it's fully laid out on its side and it's stretched out, will take up pretty much an entire piece of plywood and anything extra beyond that will help catch, you know, the fleece as it kind of is coming off the animal you know, putting down, you know, heavier tarps to sort of, if you have to do it on bedding, uh, that will help contain that. Um, a lot of times when you're pulling the animals out of the catch pen, if there's straw in the catch pen, that will get trailed out. So just thinking ahead of all those little areas where bedding and manure and that kind of thing can get caught in the fleece during the actual process. All of that stuff will eventually either need to come out or it'll just lower the value of the fleece ultimately. And it can ruin the entire clip if you are not shearing in the right conditions. Perfect. Well, let's go to our video that we shot of oh, yeah. uh, shearing and talking about, um, Emily was sharing how that process goes and you can see the setup she just referred to. Awesome. Um, when you're handling these sheep, it's, it's a three pronged uh, guide to success in terms of making sure that the entire experience is good for everybody. The first
first prong is animal preparation. Um, shears will repeat it over and over again. And a lot of people still uh, either haven't heard the message or haven't fully internalized it. But properly prepared sheep are so key to doing a humane job, a job where the animal is not struggling excessively, um, where there isn't extra energy being uh, handed out trying to, to control them. So fasting the sheep, and we say fasting, that's nothing in their stomach. So no hay, no grain, no grass. Um, even some straw, like people put down like really good like wheat straw and they'll go to town on that. Um, but trying to limit what goes into their stomach, it's the same principle as preparing yourself for some outpatient procedure. You know, even getting dental work sometimes where they put you under, they don't want you to eat for at least 12 hours before that. So trying to keep the animals as safe as possible by emptying out that stomach is so important. If you've ever... Um, been at a butchering where you've, you've seen the size of the stomach of a sheep. It is, it is massive. That stomach takes up a majority of that body cavity of that animal. So what you're dealing with is they will eat to capacity every time they eat because they are still a prey animal. And what they want to do is they want to eat when they know they're safe and eat as much as possible and then go to a safe area and digest it. And so if you are trying to shear them at the wrong point in that cycle and usually early in the morning they'll eat a lot and then they'll kind of lay down mid-morning later morning they'll go out and eat again and then sort of lay down during the hot part of the afternoon and then in the evening they'll eat again and every time they eat they will fill up and then they will go to digest so if you don't break that cycle their stomach is full to capacity pretty much all the time and so if you attempt to shear them on a full stomach when you sit them up the way we do and we put pressure downwards on it that stomach pushes up on that heart and lungs, and especially if they've just come off of rich feed, especially rich grass in the springtime, or if they've been on full grain, that, that food will be forced up the, the, into their um, mouths, and they will like respirate it, they'll cough, they'll choke on it. I mean, it causes, they, you can tell that they're scared because it's putting pressure on that things. They can't breathe. And some animals during the wrong part of the year, typically when it gets really hot out, if there's any sort of underlying medical issues, heart issues, lung issues with that animal, you'll really see that expressed then. So emptying them out, and by that I mean fasting them, no food. People will be like, well, we didn't feed grain this morning. Well, is there hay in the hay feeder? Well, yeah, but they're not eating it. Yes, they are. They're eating the hay. There could be no food in their stomachs when you're sharing. And that is to keep everybody safe because they will fight because they are feeling that choking it's, it's cutting off their air, they are starting to choke, and they will fight. So that's the first prong is preparation. The second prong is being properly prepared for the actual shearing. So you can see here we have a little pen. There's also a little, probably half a horse stall size pen behind us that we've used in the past. But sheep, during the shearing, are semi-panicked. They want to... Regardless of how friendly your sheep are and how sweet they are, they come up to you in the field, they'll give you kisses, that's fine. When a shearer walks onto the property, there's weird lights, there's weird noises, they're going to be scared and they're going to act scared. And regardless of how, even you can be the calmest person in the world and do everything real calm and move real slow, they're still going to be nervous about the whole process. And they're going to want to run, they're going to want to bolt, they're going to want to slam into corners. So having an area that is small, you want them packed in so they cannot do those running leaps and being able to harm themselves by getting too much speed up. In a large area, most people have their facilities set up for the animals to lamb and they're comfortable and they're so That's not what you want on shearing day. You need to have something where you can tighten them down and they are shoulder to shoulder lined up so that you can easily, when I go into the pen, it's amazing. You could put, we could probably put another four or five sheep in here. And it's amazing. They will squish back. And you want to be aware that they will squish somebody in a corner. These smaller ones you want to be aware of. But for the most part, you don't want them to run. You want a tight enough space that they will hunker down. They feel safe if they are touching other sheep. This guy's put his head down. He feels safe. These guys feel safe. They're not trying to bolt. They're not trying to run. And it's because it's a smaller space. And that's so important. A lot of people don't like putting them in a tighter space, especially as the, 
as you know in the springtime when most shearing gets done into the summer it's too hot they worry about that safety first they will still bolt they will still run they'll try to clear fences they'll slam into walls i've seen them take out sides of barns because they didn't have the sheep smooshed down enough and you need to do that prior to the shearer getting there sheep will move their calmness when they're with you and they will move into a slightly unknown area much better before the strange person gets there so getting them in there and keeping them safe is also a huge part of being able to humanely handle those animals and safely handle those animals so nobody gets hurt and then the last prong of that is aftercare we're shearing in the winter and a lot of people are going why are you taking the wool off when it's cold out well there's so many reasons to do that right now this is coming on hay season this is when you start feeding the majority of the hay if wool is important to you it is it should be a consideration that you will take the wool off before the majority of the hay contamination would occur, which is right now. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are lambing earlier in the year, there's a lot of people that start lambing right around Christmas. January is a big lambing month. February is a huge lambing month. And getting that wool off means you have so much more barn space and so much less moisture. So if we sheared all these guys and then put them back in here and we looked at them, they would take up this much room in the pen versus this much room in the pen. So not only do you, have you gained bunk space, you've gained floor space in your barn, you've lost the extra moisture that this wool holds, but there's also the added benefit of you can see the udder on the mudder, the, the lamb can get to the udder, it's all clean. Like there's some people that just want to crutch around the butt and that's fine, you know, that's a management decision. Um, but once you remove all that wool, you've kept it clean, you also hit them right at the point where because of lambing stress you'll get that weakness in the fiber and if you shear them right before they lamb that weakness doesn't show up at all in the fiber if you wait until a month or two after you can still have weak tips there at the bottom where it grows in um, so you can have breaks in your wool because of that lambing stress shearing them now prior to lambing means you pretty much eliminate all of that but also having a plan in terms of how to manage them in the cold make sure you're prepared to feed them more Make sure you have adequate shelter should there be any sort of inclement weather. The worst two things are moisture and wind. So if they get wet and it's cold wind, they can get chilled, you can have issues. Um, ewes that are heavily pregnant can have ketosis if they get too cold. So making sure you have some sort of wind protection, uh, protection from the cold, and feeding them does a lot of that. Again, we're going back to the food. They, they're fermentation digesters. They generate a lot of heat just by eating. So just giving them a little extra, knowing that they might shiver a little bit, and you're replacing those calories. So keeping them off feed, keeping them dry prior to shearing, making sure they're properly contained during the shearing so that everybody stays safe, and then having a proper plan for after shearing is the best way going forward to make sure that you have the best experience you know, with a shearing and, and dealing with the wool that is on your sheep. Those are the most important things. humane shearing of sheep the number one thing that tends to come up is shears abusing sheep in one way which is either hitting them or excessively cutting sheep that all goes back to making sure they're properly emptied out you tend to get those unnecessary cuts when the animal is struggling because they're uncomfortable again we're putting pressure down that stomach is putting pressure on that heart and lungs and any extra food in that stomach is going to cause them to thrash around they'll kick You'll get some that really aggressively slam those back legs on the board. It's very hard to shear in some of these more sensitive areas if they're struggling. And so you do have to handle them more aggressively. It's firmer pressure. You're trying to control the animal and put pressure on the, the limbs in such a way that they are not moving while you're trying to work the clippers. But making sure they're emptied out will eliminate part of that. And the other issue is if you do have a whole flock full of full sheep, and you're putting that extra pressure on every sheep, you are going to fatigue. And when you have a fatigue shear, and you get a sheep that kicks the hand piece, kicks the finger, kicks them in the face, or just that, that, that point where you're just exhausted and you've been fighting and fighting and fighting, that's when you see a lot of that unnecessary shear behavior that, that people love to talk about. It's not common. And it is not condoned in any shearer's circle. And it is okay to talk about it, but 
the reason those those things happen is just excessive shear fatigue. And by making sugar sheep are as emptied out as possible, will eliminate a large portion of that. Communicate with your shearer. Shearers love to offer suggestions, how to make a job easier. And when we say easier, it's not so that, oh, we have the easiest job in the world and we just want to make easy money. No, we want the job to go well. We want the animals to look good. We want everybody to be happy in the end. And nothing is more frustrating than, you know, saying, hey, take them off feet a little bit longer. It'll make it less stressful for me. It's less stress on the sheep. And then there's not that extra brain fatigue that comes into just fighting animal after animal after animal. So, you know, it, it, we as an industry need to talk and improve the conditions so that everybody, including the sheep, and most importantly, the sheep, is all being handled in an appropriate manner. Um, but yeah, I would like to add, um, if you're just getting into sheep, or, or looking to start a flock, a number one question that I get a lot is like, how do you find a shear? Shears do tend to be clustered in certain areas. Um, Iowa has some really good shears, but there again, certain shears have certain specialties. Some people do prefer to do smaller jobs. There's those guys that just prefer to do larger jobs. So knowing the questions to ask and knowing um, who to go for to find those connections um, getting involved in your state sheep association is always a great place to start. Um, most sheep associations will have producers of all sizes, you know, smaller hand spinners, pets. They'll have people like that, and they'll also have people that are running, you know, 500, 600, even up to 1,000 here in Iowa um, head flocks, and they have crews that are coming out to do those jobs. Um, so those people can usually guide you to who is doing their flocks. Um, and it's very easy to make a call, even if they're not in your area, just to touch base and say, hey, you know, we're looking to have so many sheep. We're looking to shear roughly this time of year. First off, do you know of anybody? Would you be willing to? Shearers talk. Like, we all kind of know each other. It's a very small community. So if you are having trouble finding a shearer or finding the right shearer for what you're, you're wanting, um, you know, talk to more shearers. It, it's not... It's not out of the question to, you know, call shears that are out of state and say, hey, do you know of anybody that might be traveling through? Do you know of anybody that's looking for, you know, or, or like shearing, you know, the kind of animals you have? Do you know of anybody that, you know, if, you, if hand spinning fleeces are your thing, do you know of anybody who specializes in that that would be willing to travel? Um, talk to more than just the shear that might be living in your county. Um, the people, we all know each other. It's kind of a small community again. Uh, but a lot of us travel, so, you know, be willing to talk to more than just, you know, the neighbor. Um, but also getting involved in your state association will also help guide you to finding those people. So, you know, it, it's it's a small community. ASI has a resource. Uh, the American Sheep Industry has a shears list. I mean, you can even start at the top and start calling people and say, hey, here's where I live. Do you know of anybody? Um, I've known a lot of people that have found shears just by being willing to make a couple extra phone calls to people that, might be like a total miss. They live on the other side of the country. They'll never do this, but you just never know when people are like, oh, I got family out that way. I'll, I'll come do them. So. And if you're a shearer, <laughs> reach out to state associations because they yes. can put you on their list, Yeah. you know, to let people know that you are out there and you are available and you can list what your specialties and what your preferences are. And anybody wanting to learn, um, most states through either their cooperative, you know, extension, or their sheep associations will run a shearing school. Um, so if anybody is interested in learning about shearing, uh, those opportunities are out there. Again, get involved in your state associations. Um, by doing that, not only are you counted, your numbers are counted, you know, and, and your interests can be counted and, and included in some of these things, but also, you know, you can get connected with, with other resources, shearing schools, other shears other producers that are doing what you do. Sharing ideas is the best thing for our industry. There you go. I'm unmuting. There we go. All right, I'm just gonna wait. Well, we'll see if there's any questions that have popped up, Megan will we, pass off to us. We don't have any questions on Facebook yet. Okay. Um, I have a question though. What is that? Um, I'm curious, like for farmers who may want to try to shear or learn to shear, 
um, and have a few sheep, like what would be the startup costs? Like what's your recommendation on a shearer or like what, what equipment and costs are involved? Okay. We're going to have um, Emily answer that one. So what they're, what they're asking is if there is a farmer that wants to learn to shear their own sheep or somebody that wants to get started just kind of doing their own basic things, what is the initial cost and what do they have to kind of go through to get ready to do that? Okay. So that's an excellent question. Um, first thing, if you're just talking in terms of cost, a pair of uh, clippers, which is what most people will start out with is it's going to run you at least $500. Um, my recommendation for most folks, if you are going to do them yourself, you have a small number of sheep, uh, based on the amount of time that it takes a beginner to shear a sheep, you will pretty much need one comb per sheep. Those combs normally last about an hour. So based on any previous experience you could have had, like whether you went to a shearing school, or if you're just having a friend help you, a lot of times that first sheep, the first you know, 20, 30 sheep that you do are gonna take you know, at least a half an hour, sometimes longer, depending on the breed that you're dealing with. Um, if you want it to be foolproof, having plenty of combs there, um, you know, in a perfect world, that's, you might have five to 10 sheep to, to learn on. That, that's a manageable number. If we're talking more than that, um, I highly, highly suggest you go to a shearing school. Um, I also find that it is easier for people to learn to shear at a shearing school as opposed to learning on your own sheep. There is something about that bond you have with your own livestock that holds a lot of people back. Um, the fear of harming your own animal can sometimes just prevent you from learning outright. Going to a shearing school or going to another shearing where it's other people's animals, um, you know, if, if you have, you know, other farmers that you work with, if their shear is coming and you can watch and maybe do a little bit um, of observation, maybe they're willing to work with you. But working on other people's animals will increase the speed that you, you actually learn. So backing up, though, that the cost of combs is usually $20 a comb. Cutters run around 3 to $5. Um, so that initial cost is steep. Um, you're looking at Oh, Emily, we, we lost your video or we, sorry, we lost um, your sound. Oh, you're back. So I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, so you were saying that the cutters are three to $5 each. Yes. Um, so that, that initial cost is going to easily run you, you know, $600 if you decide to skimp on combs and cutters. Um, if you really want to sink some money in, I mean, you're looking at $800 and then the cost of a shearing school, which can range from, you know, $100 to $150 for some of the more cheap schools. Some of the more expensive ones uh, that are run longer could be three to $400. So, you know, realistically, you're looking at a fair chunk of change that you're going to have to sink in uh, to do your own sheep, which is, again, why I highly recommend you going to a shearing school before you buy all the equipment. The equipment you will use at a shearing school will, you know, you'll get some ideas of some of the variations, some of the options that are out there, the types of combs you would need to purchase. You can talk to experienced shearers about the sheep that you have, try to get some recommendations. So before you run out and buy the equipment, I highly, highly recommend going to a shearing school. Find out if it really is for you because there again, it is easier to start on other people's animals versus your own. Um, but yeah, that's go to a shearing school first, but regardless, there is, there is a fairly large money sink initially. Now, granted, you will gain all that back as you do your own and you don't have to pay a share. So there's, there's pros and cons to that. Emily, how do uh, attendees find what shearing schools might be around them? So most states do host a school. Um, check with your state sheep association, the American sheep industry, has a contact list of all the state sheep associations. So go on their website. Um, the American Sheep Shears Council does have a list of schools that we are aware of, although not all of them will let us, you know, we're not fully aware of when all of them are running because some of the states are, are pretty closed knit about, you know, only wanting people from their state to come to their, their school. But most states do have one. There, there are lots on the East Coast there's a bunch on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, all have schools. 
there's definitely a really good school here in, in Iowa. There's one in South Dakota. North Dakota has a really good one. Um, there's a bunch. So definitely check with your sheep, state, state sheep association. Um, and there again, talk to people shearing in the area. Again, it never hurts to just call a shearer out of the blue and say, hey, I'm just looking for some information, trying to get some connections. Um, a lot of times the shearers will know the school that they went to and can also you know, offer recommendations uh, for things. But there's usually one within driving distance. The, word, the hardest part about shearing schools is trying to get in at the right time because a lot of times they fill up quickly. So you know, start looking now, ask the right questions, sort of figure out when the opening dates are so you can get right on it when they open up and, and start accepting people. Thanks, Emily. That was super, super insightful. We do have a comment from Kelly Duffy who says, Regina's Cormos are gorgeous. I'm intrigued with the half white, half brown sheep. I'd love to see Emily shear a Cormo sheep. Oh, oh, Regina here. I'll tell you the comment. Okay. R Regina's Cormos are gorgeous. I'm intrigued with the half white, half brown sheep. I'd love to see Emily shear a Cormo sheep. Sharing how she manages all the folds of skin is challenging. It is. And may I ask who that comment was from? Kelly Duffy. Oh, okay. Hey, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's from a long ways away. She's even colder than we are probably right now. Um, thank you. Um, the, the half white and the half black sheep, we kind of just refer to as Mr. Fancy Pants. Um, actually what you don't see is when he is shorn his back half looks typically white but when he's shorn he's got dalmatian spots all over his back end too um we have no idea really where this gene came from he was a big surprise to all of us so um he is pretty cool and um the sheep oh emily's phone dropped again all right, can you hear Regina? She's talking now. Well, Emily's coming back now. Okay. Okay, now we're back. Oh, there you're back. Yeah, so actually, um, as far as the wrinkles go regarding our Cormo, we don't have as wrinkly of Cormos as a lot of people do. Um, that's something we kind of tried to breed out, partially because <laughs> people complain. Um, no, but it, it is difficult to share all those wrinkles. Um, and honestly, I don't really think that the wrinkles contribute to the fineness of the wool. Some people will, they believe that it might. Um, we didn't really find any evidence of that. So our Cormos, we try not to have the ones with the, the really big necks and things like that. Um, as cool as they are, it's also really hard to shear and it's, it's easy for those um, wrinkles to get nicked. So, and nobody wants that to happen. So any other questions or comments and before we start kind of talking about skirting? Not yet at this time, but I'll keep watching. So let's move on okay. to the skirting demo. Okay, so um, I'll have you hold your phone before I end up flipping it on the floor. So this fleece that we have out here now, um, so this table actually that we have is um, a, a type of skirting table you can very easily build yourself. Um, we've just taken um, some one buys, made a frame and stapled snow fence over the top. We've also tried chicken wire in the past. I don't recommend that simply because the chicken wire catches the fleece and catches you. Hey, Greg, Emily's phone dropped out again. Yep, they are jumping back on. Okay. Okay, there you okay, go. we're back. So perfect. Hi, so hi everybody. So you can buy, we have a, another skirting table in the barn um, that is basically a, it's a, an actual skirting table, but these do just fine. Um, we actually used this table for many, many years before we got the other one. So you want some type of material that will have holes in it so that any second cuts or any kind of debris will fall through the table. Um, otherwise you're just rolling your, your fleece around in what you're trying to get out of it. So this particular fleece was not coated. Um, so I'll just tell you that right now. So you want to, this is the out. Greg, it keeps happening. Oh, 
And maybe she's not back. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Hey, Emily, um, unmute your phone. All right, I'm unmuted. There we go. All right, we're getting Regina's. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, some people want to put the fleece with the cut side up. Others want to put the outer tip at, up. To me, I kind of flip it over and do a little bit of both. If you put the shorn side down, then you get the second cuts, they fall out easily. Um, if you put the outer side down or the, the fleece tip down, then any debris that's in the fleece will fall out. So either way, you're doing good things. What you wanna do though, is you wanna make sure if you have a really clean coated fleece, you want to keep any contaminated areas that haven't been in the coat out of it. So this one, again, wasn't coated. So it's gonna have stuff kind of all over it anyway. We'll talk about coats in a second and their importance. Hey, Emily, can you unmute? Thanks. Yeah, I unmute. I didn't want there to be an echo. No, um, Regina's voice comes in stronger through your, your phone. So just keep oh, it how on. Funny. Okay. Okay. So you want to go around the edge of the fleece and this really isn't spread out as well as it should be. Um, but again, my fingers are kind of starting to lose some feeling. So you want to go around the outside edge, pull out any contaminated fleece. So here you have some that has um, poop in it, basically manure. Here we've got some straw and bedding. You want to take that out. You want to go through and take out any matted or cotted pieces. This can come around the neck. It can come around the, the legs. If they have coats on, this is kind of typical, especially the longer the fleece, it gets in there and it just rubs and it felt. But you, you can, can tell, tell it doesn't pull apart. It's not going to be able to go through carding equipment or to be spun well. So we just take it, throw it on the ground. So we would do this all the way around the fleece. So I always start with the edges. Again, another chunk. This would be around the back leg. Just cast it off to the side. Now, there's different things that can be done with this waste material. We have folks that will come take this and pick up bags of this to take home. It works as fertilizer and mulch in their garden. A lot of the necks, um, legs, bellies, some of the, the dirtier fleece that I wouldn't necessarily want to send to a hand spinner can be sent off to be turned into comb top. It's combed, all the debris combed out. Um, all the fibers are lined and it's a really beautiful spinning fiber. So that's, that's basically what we do. We go through, make sure all the debris is taken out. Then I just use plastic thin clear garbage bags. You can pick them up at Sam's. The fleece gets rolled up. And actually, I'm not going to do the crinkling thing. I'm sure that's probably not coming through great. So the fleece gets bundled up. Now, do you bundle it in a way to ensure that the if I am side, different sides are together? I do. I try to pull it so that if, if I'm selling a bag of fleece that's been coated and it's clean and it's not full of any debris like this is, I will pull it up so that the shorn side is out. That way, if I'm selling it as a hand fleece and let's say I'm at a fiber show, uh, people see that really pretty clean, nicely fresh cut fleece. Then if they are interested, we can take it out of the bag, open it up. They can see throughout that it's consistent, that it's clean throughout. You wanna be careful because there actually have been times where people don't think about that. And you might have a really dirty fleece underneath. 
So we've got an example of that. So this, this fiber right here, which looks not too bad. So this is the shorn side of the fiber. This is the outside of the fiber, same exact fiber. Shorn side, outside. This sheep was not coated. This goes to show, I have a lot of people ask me, is it worth um, spending the time, the effort, and the money to coat your sheep? This is why I coat my sheep. My sheep this year, we failed on coats. We really failed. Um, so all of our fleeces are contaminated and we won't be selling any as hand spinning fleeces this year. Um, a lot of reasons why sometimes coats don't work. Sometimes the sheep, you fight them and they don't leave them on. Sometimes you don't have enough sizes. Sometimes if the weather um, doesn't work well. So if you've got too hot, too humid, the sheep will sit underneath the coats. And if they pant and their body moves back and forth under that coat, they'll start felting. So this year with just time constraints, weather and everything, the coats were taken off and it, it's a bad thing. So <laughs> for no, no better way to put it. Um, it's a sad thing, really. So, so anyway, Regina, so the, yes. can you hear me? Yes. So it's hard to pick up on the video, but are there just like lots of little specks of hay in that? There are. So what, what happens, happens is the the debris inside the it, it's kind of hard to tell it's hard to see up close um there's a lot of hay chaff um the storm, storm we, we had this summer knocked down a lot of cedar and pine trees so there was a lot of cedar and pine laying around on the ground there's a lot of that mixed in with this if sheep are heating eating at a hay feeder um as they pull the hay out all their all neighbors their are pulling hay, pulling hay out. And obviously, and obviously they, pull they, pull out, they pull it out, they turn, turn their heads, heads and, and they, they drag, drag it across the sheep next to them. So, so what the coats, what the coats do, do is the coat goes over the animal, the head goes through, got a piece across the chest to hold it in place, and it covers up the prime part of the fleece. So these particular fleece have a drawstring in the back, so it can be cinched up to make sure that the coat fits well. It's also got an elastic band that would go across the back of the neck that again just helps the coat fit well. Um, it's not gapping to where they can get caught on fences or they can get their leg through the neck hole. So these coats cost about, a, about $20 a piece. We spend a lot of time mending them over the years, um, which takes some time, but it, it definitely increases their wear. So this $20 coat takes this really dirty fleece that has very minimal value without me investing more money for processing and turns it into, in, in some case, excesses $40 a pound fleece. So the, and, and a sheep will, at least ours will average um, about five pounds of skirted fleece a lot of times. So as you can see, that's a pretty significant amount of money by putting on a $20 coat and making sure you change it. We go through about five coat changes a year. Um, you wanna make sure the coat is not too tight. Um, you wanna make sure it stays clean because if it's dirty, it's not gonna keep the, the fleece clean. So the next thing that we do after hey, Regina, we have bagged this fleece. Yes. A quick question for you. Grace Tully commented that might be a, a quote unquote dirty fleece, but the color is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is, it's an, uh, yeah. And we've got some that, colors. So if you, if you're considering that dirty and you can't sell it for top dollar, then what, like, what is that secondary market? Well, what I do with it is I will take this and I send it off to a mill in Michigan. 
um, Zeilinger's Wool Crossing, and they turn it into a product called Comb Top. So it, it gets washed and it goes through carding combs that pull out all of the extra vegetable matter and it aligns the fibers perfectly. So what you get back instead of this matted dirty mess is you get this beautiful um, perfect spinning fiber. So I dye a lot of it um, and we sell it to hand spinners. So again, there is value in this, but I have to put money into it to bring the value back. Where if I don't have to do this, we're able to just sell the raw fleece and then people process it themselves. So um, the secondary market, it adds a complication. You've got shipping, um, you have wait time to be able to get the fiber back. Um, and it's just extra steps that sometimes we don't want to take. So, and had I taken extra steps for the code, you know, live and learn. <laughs> it's 2020. So yeah, it's 2020. <laughs> Regina, we we did have a, a question. Have a question. We have a question. Oh. We have okay. a question what? that came in um, earlier that I missed about Mr. Fancy Pants. Is <laughs> Is he a bre breeding ram? And do his, yes, yes. if so, do his genes breed true for color? I will let you know that um, <laughs> we just used him for breeding the first time. Shame on you for not using him last year. <laughs> he, was he was basically too young last year. So last year he was just a, a not quite a yearling yet when um, when we shared him last year. So, so yes. Um, we don't know what we're going to get out of them. They might turn out all white and absolutely nothing spectacular, you know? Yeah, we'll like, but. we would like an update on that one. We'll do it. You stay tuned. Um, so, Regina, we have seven minutes left. Okay. I, I'm curious, and, and you can ask Greg, shall we um, share a shearing video? Would you like to share a shearing video? Um don't have a good one ready okay I, I okay um did you hear that megan i have one okay she megan, says she one. has one okay yeah I, I think so. whatever okay i'm gonna share that now okay Okay.
Hey, Emily, can you hear me? Yes. Can, while we're watching the video, someone asked, can you explain what the combs and cutters are? Okay, so just like on a pair of scissors, there is a top piece of metal and a bottom piece of metal. And those two pieces of metal have to come together on a flat surface to actually, actually cut the fiber. Um, the comb is actually the larger portion, the bottom portion. I don't have any in here with me, but it is the, the bottom flat piece. And it actually looks like a hair comb to a certain extent. Um, the cutter is the smaller kind of triangular piece that runs across the top. And it's the piece that does most of the work. Um, it's thinner metal. Your cutters need to be replaced more often than your comb. Your comb can usually go for a solid hour. The cutter needs to be replaced depending on the kind of sheep you're working on and how dirty they are. You know, I, I tend to replace mine about every three to eight sheep, depending. Um, here on these cormos, they were doing pretty good. I was getting about five on a cutter. But yeah, the cutter is the smaller piece that's moving back and forth across the comb. And they come together in a flat surface, like, like a bunch of little scissors that are they're working to cut the wool off. And they can't be sharpened. They have to be replaced. No, no, no. They can be resharpened. Okay. Um, that is an added cost. Uh, but a lot of like Premier One will, will do resharpening. There's, there's several companies out there that do resharpening. Um, a lot of your more professional shears will just own a, a grinding plate. Um, so you have to hollow grind them. So it's not like you can do it at home with just sort of any kind of grinder. Uh, but, but that is an additional piece of equipment that again, if you wanted to actually shear sheep and do it for a living, it, it's worth the investment um, to do. Well, it is certainly mesmerizing to watch. <laughs> But I, I will add, and, and for those of you like getting into sheep, there are different types of combs and cutters. And depending on what breed of sheep you, you end up with, um, there is a, a different type of comb or cutter that you would use depending on the breed. So again, you know, talking to shears and finding out what they would recommend in terms of like the, the type of brand and the type of, you know, lead and bevel on, on combs. Um, it, highly recommend connecting with somebody and actually getting good, you know, frontline information versus, you know, a lot of people like to keep it all here close. You know, I just want to go and I want to share my own sheep and I just want to, you know, do my own thing, but, you know, getting that kind of information right off will save you a lot of money long-term. Great. Well, we're almost at time. So Greg, do you want to wrap us up? Do you want to wrap us up? Greg, we can't hear you. You're muted. There we, oh, go. there we go. Perfect. All right. I want to thank Emily and Regina for taking time out of today. Uh, the shearing day is a busy, busy day on the farm. And so to take that time is incredibly generous and we appreciate that. Uh, there's so much to learn here. There's so much that we've gathered and uh, we have a third part to this series that's going to happen at our annual conference on January 21st. So check that out. Um, and you can register for that online at practicalfarmers.org, where we'll be visiting Regina's shop, Esther and Company, where she sells a lot of these fibers, plus a lot of other local made items. So please fill out the evaluation that Megan has shared in the comment link and tell us what you thought of today and uh, how we can continue to improve these. We know audio was an issue on this one. <laughs> so we're going to keep working on that. 
But I want to appreciate everybody for tuning in and we'll see you at the next virtual event.